Oh, what, what else? Guys, this is really fast. I normally go, don't go this fast. I can slow down. Really on point with the answers. I, I do try, yeah, well, people have, say I have a tendency to waffle on forever, so I'm trying to be a bit more concise than usual. And I'm so used to people waffling on and on and on and on and on. This is like... Oh. It's because, you know, I don't consider myself very interesting, so I'm not like, let me tell you, te it's just, I'll just tell you what you want to know, what you want to hear. <laughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and fellow mixers out there. This is Mixtape Tonight. I'm your host, Mike Mixtape, and tonight's guest I'm going to talk to She's a famed YouTuber. She's got a quite a nice fan base. Uh, she uh, started out in reviews, and she's doing something different with her channel now. But we'll talk about that later on in the interview. This is Eye of Saul. Hey. Hello, everybody. How's it going? Pretty good. How you doing? Good. Good, good. Uh, so this is a show where we get deep and personal. Think of it as like a therapist in a way. You just sit back, relax, and I'm just gonna talk about deep questions with you. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so the first question I always ask my guests is, what is the earliest memory you can think of of watching a movie, a show, or what have you? Uh, the earliest memory of a show was watching the Powerpuff Girls. Uh, that's the very first show I ever remember watching. Uh, the first movie I remember watching was I went to the theater. I believe it was with my dad, but I don't I don't remember. And it inspired my dream to join the entertainment industry because of the the movie I saw, which was <laughs> oh um, a <laughs> Pixar movie I believe. I don't specifically remember, but I saw the. Um, credits. As I finished watching the movie, the credits were scrolling and I saw all these names scrolling by and all I could think one of my earliest memories was that I just said I wanted to be like them because these are the people who make others happy. Whether or not that ended up being true is debatable but I knew that I wanted to be on the, the I wanted to be in the credits of a movie uh, um, that was where the dream began Okay well, that kind of leads into my next question, because I want to know, like, was, I, you might not know the movie, but was there another movie or show that led you into, like, looking at the behind the scenes, wanting to get into the industry a bit more? Mm, nothing specific. Just the, all the movies I watched, all the shows I watched. I was like, damn, I want to do this someday. Oh, cool, cool. Uh, so that <laughs> did that passion lead into school and college you know in that kind of direction certainly not school no but work uh just working my ass off all the time every day seven days a week to achieve my goals even if it meant giving up everything else ah so uh what were the uh jobs and work you've done uh well mostly tech based jobs so getting into support uh, technical support kind of thing so because I didn't really come up from an artistic background I came from a technology background I figured that would be the easiest way to get into the entertainment industry but I did try different things I tried acting I tried singing I tried background acting uh, all this kind of stuff and the only thing that really stuck was editorial and technical support uh, so sticking trying to stick with the school genre here did you do anything like any theater work or any um singing or any like drama in school in school like through um, middle to high school, school i did every possible theater related thing you could do because i love acting i don't know if i'm good at it or not but i love doing it um and singing up until a certain point I really I did like singing and I thought yeah this would be good because I'm all right at singing but nowadays I'm very self-conscious about my singing so I get kind of gave up on that um, but I was in choir in grade nine it was lead soprano 
Uh, but but they didn't really teach us to sing in that class. It's just like you can sing. All right, take this class. Well, you just sing when we tell you to sing. Uh, it's really going pretty fast. I'm kind of surprised. <laughs> um, so I guess it can lead right into YouTube. Uh, you created. I'm actually looking at your YouTube channel right now. Actually, uh, mm-hmm. you joined YouTube October fifth, two thousand eight. Uh, you started posting some, I would say, random videos with cartoons yeah. and <laughs> some gameplay footage. Um, do you have when you first started YouTube? Did you have like a idea of what you wanted to do on YouTube? No. Just randomly, like- just post whatever. <laughs> I didn't really start posting until 2011, so I only really had the account just because, because you know. Uh, but then when in 2011, my brother started clipping all of these like random cartoon clips that we that we thought were funny, and then I just started uploading them to YouTube. Uh, and then I started Twitch streaming in 2014, um, mostly because I was really bored and needed something to do, and then I just started uploading clips of that to YouTube. So there's no like grand story behind the beginning of my YouTube channel. It began because I felt like it, and my main content started because I felt like it. (laughs) So, yeah. How did you come up with your channel name? So, I've explained this like 10 million times, but I will explain it as well. When I was 14, I started writing a series of books uh, that were called Paradox. That's the name of the series. And one of the characters in the books is named Saul. Um... And in the fourth book that I never ended up finishing, I was like a hundred pages away from finishing, um, there's this line, and I don't remember it off the top of my head, but I can read it. It's a bit over dramatic and fluffy, but, um, you know, that was sort of the way I, I did things back then. So the whole line is, And in the eyes of Saul, they bore no mercy, witnessing an infinite span of repeating lives, shouldering the burden of being the harbinger of the end times. The bodies of the old generation lie at his feet, while he tills the soil for a new generation. He waits and watches as eons pass him by, undying, unceasing, he waits. For in the eyes of Saul, there is no mercy. That was the whole line. But eyes of Saul sounds really clunky, so I just shortened it to eye of Saul and just made it one word. Ah, 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 that's cool. Uh, do you still continue writing? Mm, so I don't write novels anymore because nobody gave a toss about my novels. No, I write cartoon scripts, mostly, now. I will ask that later. Uh, I'll put a pin in that right now. Uh, okay. So, so uh, that leads into 2015 in particular because that's when you started doing reviews. How yeah. did the process of coming up with a review series go about? Uh, I sat down, and I started writing the things I thought, and then I spent two weeks learning Adobe Premiere, and then I shot a video out onto YouTube, and it seemed to go down pretty well with people, so then I made it another one, and I just never stopped doing it for four years. Yeah, I noticed that when scrolling through your videos, it's just like, four years later, it's like, I'm not doing reviews, it's like, you're so close to five years, but it was just like to the times well okay before we get deeper into that what is your favorite video that you've made um i think the gravity falls review is probably my favorite because it was where i started that story which to be honest now is like the epitome of cringe but it was where i I started to learn how to string things together as a story as opposed to just a bunch of shots together into a review so um yeah i I mean, it's pretty cringe now, but I still, it's, it was sort of like a watershed moment for the show. Um, and yeah, it'll, it'll, not to mention Gravity Falls is my favorite cartoon of all time, too, so it was great to review it. Cool, cool. What's your favorite movie? Uh, oh, jeez. It really depends, to be honest. I don't have, like, a specific favorite movie. It, it fluctuates. I think one of my consistent favorite ones would be Final Fantasy VII Advent Children Complete, just because of the history I have with that. The Lego movie. Um, yeah, kind of those two. Oh, I mean, there's lots of Disney... I like Pixar movies. I like some DreamWorks movies, but I wouldn't say they're my favorites. They're just good. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um... What's your background on gaming? What's your favorite games, consoles? 
Um, I, I don't really have a favorite console. I just prefer games. I'm not like a console fanboy. If there's a game I want to play on the console, I will buy the console. Okay. Um, not loyal. But in terms of games, Alan Wake, Professor Layton and the Unwound Future, Kingdom Hearts 2, South Park, The Stick of Truth, Majora's Mask, Twilight Princess, Final Fantasy 7 slash 9. They're, they're e- pretty much equal, but for different reasons. Um... <laughs> That's, that's kind of it. Um, oh, and Team Fortress 2. Of course, Team Fortress 2. The old standby. <laughs> nice. Uh, God, what was the... Okay, I don't want to say the worst, but what was like the most cringiest or like bad video you've made? Oh, boy. Uh, the first collaboration, in gigantic quotes, collaboration I ever did was on Pokemon the first movie. And it was this god-awful review where I just told a bunch of shit jokes and pretended I didn't know anything about Pokemon. And just was like, yep, this movie's shit. And then just, it's a, it's a bad video. It's really bad. So It was you... bad even when I released it. So, you are a fan of Pokemon, or no? No. No, I know about Pokemon. I do. O- only really first gen, because that was the only generation I played. I don't think it's best, it was just that was when Pokemon was relevant to me, so that's when I played it. Uh, but I do know a fair bit about Pokemon, I just pretended I didn't, because I thought it'd be funnier for that video, but it was not funnier. <laughs> uh, so, are, would you be interested in watching Detective Pikachu this year? No. Not even uh, for the memes. Just... Uh... <laughs> It doesn't interest me. It's it looks like it looks like a movie that's made for Pokemon fans, and I'm I'm not a fan. I'm okay. familiar with Pokemon, but I don't think that's enough of an excuse to go see it. Okay. If it turns out that it's like super good, like everyone says, like this is actually an extremely good movie, not just because it's Detective Pikachu, but because it's a good movie, I might right. go see it. You know, for the memes or whatever. But um, currently, I'm not planning to see it. Yeah. Uh, any movies you're excited to see this year? Wouldn't say excited. I don't have any obligation to see movies anymore, so. Mm-hmm. Um, no, not really. I'm not a hype. Keep in mind, I'm not a hype beast or anything like that. If something interests me, I will go experience it or see it or whatever. But I'm not like, oh my god, guys, this is happening now. I cannot breathe. It's not. I think there's only been a couple things I've been like that about. When Kingdom Hearts 3 was first announced, I was like, holy shit. Um, when Cloud was announced for Smash 4, I shit my pants. Um, that's kind of it, really. <laughs> it's just small things. Uh, In general, is... though, I am not a hype beast at all. <laughs> okay. What is your stance on the Disney live-action films? I hate them. I hate the idea of them. It's not they they weren't made because somebody had a good idea for a movie and a big vision in their head. They're going to tell the story of a lifetime. They made them because oh, the people who really like this they're really nostalgic. We can suck as much money as we possibly can out of them. That is the only reason these movies exist and as tech demos as well. So they can go away, as far as I'm concerned. There's no artistic merit in these movies whatsoever. I know a lot of people work really hard on them, but <laughs> working really hard doesn't automatically mean something is good. Not even like John Favreau's The Jungle Book and the upcoming Lion King film? Lion King looks boring as hell, and I have not seen Jungle Book, because it just looked dull to me. It looked like just boring jungle stuff. Keep in mind, I didn't even really like the original Jungle Book. It's not my thing. Uh, so I'm really more of a 90s Disney kind of person. Uh, the Renaissance, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what? Which ones did you like in particular? Hunchback and Notre Dame's my favorite, not counting the Gargoyles. I hate the Gargoyles. But the movie outside of the Gargoyles is really good. Um, Tarzan is the most significant, I would say. To me, like, on a personal level, but in terms of actual quality, I think Notre Dame is the best of the 2D animated Disney movies. Yeah, Tarzan, I agree. I remember that in my youth, and hearing that Phil Collins soundtrack just got me going. That yeah, got me actually I used to, to like Phil Collins. I used to like singing it when I could actually sing in front of people. I used to like singing, because my mom had the whole soundtrack on CD, so I just stole it and would just play it over and over and over again. 
Oh man, that's she likes Phil Collins. Yeah, she yeah. likes Phil Collins. Oh nice. Whoa, oh my <laughs> Oh, I'm more of a Genesis fan, uh, more than mm-hmm. his solo career. No, I'm just kidding. See, I like Peter Gabriel's uh, solo career much more than Genesis. Peter Gabriel is good solo. Ah, nice. And he uh, didn't go, whoa, oh my. <laughs> what? Speaking of music, what, what kind of music do you, like, listen right to? Right now, I'm listening to a lot of, like, EDM music because it's good to edit too. It's very mindless. Um, but, it, like, the mainstay genres that I enjoy are symphonic metal, uh, heavy metal, just a lot of metal. Um, anything that kind of gets me thinking about stuff is good. Uh, but honestly, if the song sounds good, I don't really care what genre it is. Like, I don't really like rap music, but I do have a couple rap songs. I don't like country music, but I have a couple mm-hmm. country songs. It, it really depends. Ah. Uh. Nice, nice. I let's just say I'm not that picky when it comes to genre, just songs. Okay, okay. Um, still scrolling through your YouTube channel, seeing uh, lots of reviews, still lots of plays. Any any particular game you love playing? Just my favorite games, really. I like games where I can just sort of zone out and not think that much, um, which is why I like puzzle games. Uh, puzzle platformers specifically. Some puzzle games are a bit too obtuse for me, but I like puzzle platformers like Inside and Limbo and Braid, you know, the mainstays. Um, yeah, uh, sometimes I like playing games that have really long 100% completions because it's just something to do. It's just something to get my mind off of stuff. Even if it's tedious as fuck, it doesn't really matter because it's just something to get your mind off of life for a few hours. Which is why I'm replaying Final Fantasy VIII 100% right now. Because it's just really tedious. <laughs> uh, any collaborations that you did like doing on your channel? I really liked collaborating with Phantom Strider because I actually went to his hotel when he was visiting Vancouver. And it was the only collaboration I did with someone actually there. It wasn't just, mm. you know, cutting between different locations. Um, I enjoyed collaborating with Fiction Addiction as well. He's a nice, agreeable chap. Um, collaborating with the people on the bootleg Disney Princess was fine, too. There wasn't any major drama or anything like that. Ah, um, and right. back when he would actually speak to me, I enjoyed collaborating with Pie Guy Rules. Cool. Cool. Lots of, uh, just trying to, da 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 what, um... I noticed there's a bunch of vlogs... Are there any topics that you would love to talk about fully in a video, in a vlog? Well, I don't do vlogs, um, but... Because I hate vlogs, um, <laughs> with a passion. So that'd be something I'd talk about, is how much I hate vlogs. Um, not, I kind of just find talking about whatever, even if I'm not really educated on the subject. You say if someone was talking to me about cars as long as they're passionate about it then I can enjoy the conversation I just like talking to people talking about stuff I don't really care what it is ah okay okay cool uh, there are things I feel strongly about for sure but the, 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 that'll come in the future uh, uh, so okay let's just talk about uh, so you are writing cartoons yes what does it entail what is it for? Not, what is it? not not saying anything specific. I've already had one concept leak unintentionally, so I'm not talking anything specific plot-wise. Right. But right. what it entails is developing the idea, um, and then once it's in a malleable state where these the fine details have been hammered down, you know what you want to do, the goal is set in stone, you start doing art assets and scripts, so stuff that can be representative of your idea physically um once that's done you can start thinking of certain uh vignettes that you want to express in concept art so stuff you'd want to show a prospective buyer once you're done with that you start developing a pitch bible so your demographics your genre your goals overall your episode synopses slash season roadmaps if it's a long concept uh as well as details about your concept and then once you've got all that done uh, try to find a method of pitching it, specific, preferably for someone you already know or contact within the animation industry. 
and try to get your foot in the door. Uh, so you're doing it, this all independently, okay. Yeah, and then if you can't get your foot in the door, just do it yourself. Just find a way to get the money and do it yourself. Uh, so it's a, clearly a passion project then, right? I've had multiple cartoon ideas in various stages of uh, pitch development. Some of them are just ideas with no art assets. Some of them are only scripts with no art assets. Some of them are all art assets and pitch bibles and scripts that have not been purchased. So it's a it's a slog for sure. But hey, the chance will come soon to pitch something again. I've already, I've had channel I've had Frederator interested in an idea. I've had independent producers interested in ideas. Um, but I've never had anything past the the consideration point. Ah, uh, okay. That's, that's as far as I've gotten. So you clearly have more of a passion for cartoons in the medium in general. What are your favorite cartoons besides Gravity Falls, as you said before? Um, so Bojack Horseman is my favorite adult drama. I know it's a, technically a dramedy, but there's more drama to it. But South Park is my all-time favorite cartoon for adults. Uh, just because it's it's very special to me. Uh, yeah, but there's lots of cartoons I enjoy. Too many to name, to be uh, honest. Cool. That I can dig. I, I, I mean, we all grew up on cartoons, and that's just something we attach to as a kid, just watching, being entertained, and enjoying these characters over the years, depending on how long it lasts for. Um, yeah. Uh... So, you stopped doing reviews. What is your plan with the channel now? So, the main content is going to be sort of mostly similar to the latest upload that I have, which seems to have ruffled quite a few more feathers than I was expecting. <laughs> Not with audiences, with other reviewers. Uh, I wasn't uh, expecting that. I didn't think they'd even care what I said about them because they don't like me. Uh, but my content is going to be in that vein. So it's sort of like a combination of Nerd City and Vsauce, but less about specific people and topics and more about broad overviews of certain things. Basically, the, the goal of these videos is to brew discussion about the topics as opposed to, this is my opinion and you have to listen to it now. <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, that was one reason I turned off of reviews is because I was tired of espousing my opinion as if it was fact. Whereas I prefer discussion over opinion. Um, so that was that. I'm also going to be doing writing and pitching advice videos for people and concept creators who want to get their ideas developed. Because I do pitch evaluations through my own studio. People come to me with their ideas and they tell me them. And I give them feedback as to how they can improve their pitches to improve their chances of getting them purchased in the future. So I want to make some general advice videos for people to watch. So that even if they don't want to pitch me their idea, they can benefit from it. Uh, could you explain what your company is? It's just, it's sort of a, a dual company. So it's Wannabe Studios. So it's my animation company, I guess. Uh, so one part of it is sort of an artist agency. So I find jobs for artists and animators to do. They do it. And then I manage the, the project and then take 10% of the the cost basically so yeah like an artist agency that part's kind of gone to sleep for the moment because i'm focusing on other stuff there was we did a big pilot project with a subcontractor for 25 grand and the whole thing was a shit show and we didn't even end up getting credited in the end on the project so that, that's about parts gone to sleep for now uh the other part is producing my own content so cartoons and youtube stuff and all that stuff um, that's just for me to do under a banner of, yeah, this is the studio work. So I can put it on a resume instead of saying, this is YouTube stuff, I can say, this was work for this studio, if that makes sense. Uh, that does make sense. What? So is your company the main source of your income, or what is your... <laughs> is it part-time, full-time? No, I know, it's, I know. it's very much part-time. I have a full-time job in the animation industry currently, which is what pays the bills. Um, any money I get from the side is just supplementary income. So I'm not trying to do YouTube stuff or Twitch stuff as a career anymore. That was the goal because I was not I was working retail 
part time, and it's like, well, why not try to do this for a living? But now it's a, it's not a reasonable goal. So even if I get to the point where I am making the majority of my money on YouTube, which is unlikely, but let's just say hypothetically it does happen, I'm still not quitting my job. There's much more avenues for success in my current industry than there is with self-made content. Because with self-made content, it will never end well. I don't know a single person who does YouTube for a living that had it end well. So as, as opposed to having a real structured entertainment industry job where I can network with people and work my way up to a position I enjoy, yeah, I might not make as much as YouTube, but it's a stable income for a job I enjoyed doing. Uh, could you spare the details of the animation job? Nope. I was doxxed in November, and so I'm no longer revealing publicly where my workplace is, what I do, or how you can find me there. <laughs> All right. I, I tried. I tried, at least. Um... I can tell you the story of the doxing, though, if you want to hear about that. Oh, really? Well, how's that yeah. go? Um, so I, I didn't even like tweet about this when it was happening because it's like, that's exactly what this guy wants. Um, mm -hmm. so I'll just give you the brief overview, but basically, uh, I, you know, I have the discord server for my show. So people mm -hmm. who enjoy my stuff can go to the discord and talk with people. There was this guy there, um, something was going on with him, and he, he was having some problems and he started insulting other people in the discord, just being really rude. Um, so... I banned him for being rude and also leaving the server and rejoining with multiple accounts. We considered them spam accounts, the mods and I, so right. I, I banned him, basically, for being rude and for spamming accounts. So a day goes by and everything's fine, and then somebody tweeted at me or sent me a DM and said, Hey, this guy just emailed your boss and tried to get you fired. And I was like... Okay, so I went to HR immediately and was like, uh, this guy is trying to get me fired by saying that I broke my NDA with the company and revealed spoilers for the movie that was being worked on, which is not true. Um, what The clip that he shared with my employers basically said that I talked about my employers, and it was in a positive way. I basically said that I see these people working their asses off every day to make the best possible product they can. No story spoilers, no character or anything. It was just complimenting my coworkers. That's all I did. Um, but he tried to get me fired with that. So um, obviously he didn't <laughs> but uh, because there was nothing there. But they had to launch an investigation against me just on the off chance I happened to say something, which I didn't. Um, and, you know, nothing came of it. But for a few days I was quite stressed out because, you know, when you're being investigated by the MPAA or whatever, it's not, not, not happy times. So nothing came of it, but it ultimately it led to my decision to stop doing reviews and also to not publicly reveal my workplace or details of my work, um, yeah, in any public forum. Because crazy people can come and try to get me fired, apparently, so, yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, Indeed. That, that's, uh, whoa, 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 wow. Yeah. Wow. So I decided not to milk the situation, which is why I didn't tweet about it. I didn't make a video about it. Only people who knew about it were the people on the Discord because they were part of the situation. Uh, because it was like, what's the point? I can't be like, oh my god, guys, this happened to me. It's my thing and I'll deal with it. So, But since the situation's over now, I can talk about it. <laughs> the hilarious thing, though, I'll just say, is that this guy... Well, he tried to dox me. He was not at all private about his personal information. So if he wanted, I could have doxed him, too. Like, I knew his name. I knew where he lived. I knew his workplace. I knew his phone number. I knew everything about him because he put it all online. And it was super easy to find. But, you know, I didn't do that because it was like, whatever. He's like 18 years old and a twat. So I'll just leave him alone and leave him to think about what he did. So, so much drama. I know, but it wasn't worth talking about. It wasn't worth making it into a big hoo-ha. I had made big hoo-hahs about minor stuff before, and I decided to stop doing it. Stop making hoo-hahs about everything. Um, whether or not I've stuck to that since then is debatable. I've had some hoo-hahs on Twitter, for sure. But, like, making videos about hoo-hahs. Basically, I'm not, not right. doing that anymore. Right. Ah. Right. Uh. So that's that story. I heard I heard a slight echo, so that's why I was just testing it out. Okay. 
Um, oh, yeah, that's that's that story. <laughs> yeah, um, there's there's got to be drama wherever you go. In some weird cases, I know it's hard to, to avoid it, but it's just like it pops up. It's I even had drama in my past as well. It's just you just gotta have to get over it and move on to something bright and green. So, well, I, yeah. If I had made a video about it, you know what it would have said? It wouldn't have said, look at me triumph over adversity. It would have said, come and get me. So, <laughs> rather than do that, uh, you know, just keep it to myself. Right, yeah. And, you, and Based upon what I'm noticing right now, you're not the type of person who would do a video like that. Just, like, vlog well, about I it in general. To... There was a time where it was like, yeah, any minor inconvenience happens, better make a video about it. Uh, <laughs> but no, I stopped doing that after a while because it's not the kind of attention I want. What The kind of attention I want is over what I say as opposed to, oh my god, you guys, my life. You can get that literally anywhere else on the internet. Go to Tumblr for five seconds, watch some Instagram bitch, whatever, just, and they'll cry about how things are so bad all the time. It's, it's, I don't want to make that content anymore. I just want... I don't need to spill my entire life on the internet, is what I'm saying. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I mean, you, you create the content you want to create. That's all you want to do. I mean... Right. With several changes. Um, what the heck? I'm just trying to see. Because it's been... Let's Plays. Really nothing... Um, yeah, there was a time I used to stream on YouTube because I had more subscribers on YouTube than Twitch. So I'm like, dude, that'll get me more views. So I did that. But then obviously that, that did, didn't work out. So I moved back over to Twitch and have not regretted moving back to Twitch since doing that. Uh, um, how often do you Twitch? Um, I try for two to three times a week unless I'm working on a video. Then I, I need to focus on that. You're actually pretty close to 35,000 subscribers. That's actually yeah. quite a feat. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I don't... I don't. See, what's important to me is how many people watch my video, not how many people subscribe to my channel, because if you check, not even 10% of my subscribers watch my videos. My channel... <laughs> it's crap! <laughs> um, and I've got... Yeah, I've got a large... I, I've got an ever-expanding e-penis in my subscriber count, but it doesn't mean anything it, to me. It's just a number. What's important to me are metrics that I can use for success, such as watch time and engagement. So sub subscribers are great. If you choose to subscribe, it's great. But it doesn't mean what it used to. Subscribers used to be like a real valuable asset. Now it's days, it's just look at how big my e-dick is. It's big, isn't it? It's just a thing to wave in front of other people and be like, yeah, look at me with my huge e-penis. It's bigger than yours. So I don't, I don't, like I said, I'm not doing this for a living anymore, so I don't care. If you subscribe, great. If you don't, uh, whatever. So, did you expect this much viewership when you first started doing these reviews? Did you expect this community to pop out when making this content? I never had any expectations for anything. I know I don't deserve anything, so why should I expect anything? Uh, uh, okay. Oh. I know we made a video about the cartoon community. What? That it's just what? Okay, what part of the community are you a part of now? Since you left the cartoon community. None. I don't want to be part of a community. I don't want to be like. So people have get, said that. Oh, so you're part of the commentary community now? No. So. I guess you could say maybe portions of my content are considered um, commentary on stuff, but it's commentary on certain situations, whereas I equate commentary community with, like, people whining about what YouTubers and Instagram and Twitch people do, which is not what I'm doing. I don't care what other YouTubers do. I really don't. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to be part of any community because this is what always happens. I get into a community and at first it's like, yeah, cool networking and all that. But then it always breaks down in the end and it turns out the community is full of a bunch of assholes who are just self-serving. All they care about is themselves 
and they perpetuate a bunch of tired and cyclical ideas, not all of which I agree with, but if you don't agree with it, you're toxic and a bad guy. So I, I'm perfectly fine being just an entity unto myself. If I guess if you had to put me in a community, it would be the commentary community, but I disagree heavily with that, um, that assertion. Hmm. Is that equivalent to your thoughts on YouTube as a whole? YouTube is just a bunch of assholes trying to be the center of attention. <laughs> me too. The only thing is, is that I'm fully aware that I'm an asshole, and it's your choice whether or not to give me attention. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's just a platform to, you know, show stuff, you know, show who you are, or just talk about what you want. I mean, I just do it just to entertain people and talk to interesting people and to promote others, you know. I mm -hmm. do it in my free time, you know, as a hobby, because I don't sure. see a future doing YouTube as a job. It's like, I know what YouTube's doing, and they're just a it's a piece of crap, you know? It's the service they do to YouTubers. What the fuck? It's just weird. Yeah, so, so I also started doing it as a hobby, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's the people who try, who really tried to do it for a living who are like, I want to escape reality and just do YouTube for a living. They're the most asshole -ish people on the website, especially people like reaction channels and, oh. you know... Mr. Mr. Mean Man himself, uh, you know, the Pauls. Uh, these people who are just, they're, all they want to do is make their channels into money-making machines and have absolutely no passion or integrity behind anything that they make. Makes me sick. So, you know, when I was trying to do YouTube for a living, I was a lot more sycophantic. I was a lot more scrubbery. I was a lot more, oh my god, you guys, YouTube is great. But now that I don't care... And I'm also several years more jaded than when I began. I'm not afraid to say that the website is a bunch of assholes being assholes and trying to be the center of attention. That's like every website. It's like Twitter, it's Instagram, it's Tumblr, it's not really Reddit necessarily. It's sort of Reddit. Um, it's, you know, that's sort of what the internet is. It's just a bunch of assholes vying for attention. <laughs> it's, the internet is a place where... It, it's, it's full of idiots, and every single person thinks they're the smartest person on the internet. Damn. Um, I mean, is there anything good on the internet nowadays? I guess it all depends on what you're into and where you look. You know, some people are into, like, videos of kittens being stomped to death. Some people like watching Jake Paul. <laughs> it really depends on what you're into. It depends on the person, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Boy, you you love your memes, right? Oh boy, I certainly love my memes. <laughs> Who dog, Zooey Mama? Do I love my memes? I mean, I've seen you post memes. I've seen like, how's how's the internet in, in meme culture? It's pretty toxic. <laughs> but it's it, it's sort of like um, it's like a hot tub that's just slightly too hot. Like, if you sit in it long enough, you either get used to it or you die of dehydration. It really depends on what your tolerance for heat is. And my tolerance for heat is really, really, really high. So sometimes it can get a bit too hot. Sometimes I feel like maybe I should get out. But in general, I'm okay. I'm okay in the hot tub of memes. Any uh, memes you like in particular? Of this year's memes, I think the only one of any real quality was the Shaggy meme. That one was good because it inspired creativity, like storytelling. That was It wasn't just a boilerplate, repetitive meme. It was like people could tell their own stories about powerful Shaggy. And I really enjoyed it while it was going on. But then people were like, oh my god, you guys, this is just Chuck North meme number two. And it's like, no... It really isn't. The Chuck Norris meme was just the same joke over and over and over again. Whereas the Shaggy meme, it was the same idea, but it was accomplished differently. I thought that was really good. But then there were shit memes this year, like the Mafia City one was terrible, the Lemon <laughs> Car was awful. All the January memes were terrible. Um, there, there's a lot of shit memes this year. For sure. 
January is usually a shit month anyway, so... Uh... It, well, it's because everybody wants to be the meme of the month. Instead, now it's the meme of the day, because they get killed so fast. So there's oh, just yeah. all this garbage memes coming out. But the Mafia City one really bothered me. That one sucked ass. Damn. No, yeah. The it meme- just... Ugh. Ugh. Memes, memes are so different nowadays, because... It's not a month, it's usually a day. Maybe a week, and then they move on to the next one. It's that it's high attention spans of that's like move on to the next one, move on to the next one, move on to the next one. It doesn't some stay for a while, but some are like, ah, that's gone. I actually did a three part um meme study. I was studying memes for a bit and trying to figure out what exactly made a meme dank and how one could apply that to future memes. Um they didn't get very much attention, but the people who did read those memes were like, yeah, I agree. Because there was this debate, this really annoying debate, actually, where it's like, oh my god, you guys, make dank memes dank again. It's like, it's, it's nobody's fault but your own for making dank memes not dank. Because so many people are trying to be the meme mam of the day that they don't know what dank memes are. So then you get the whole, like, normies re thing going on. Which I don't agree with at all. Um, I think education on memes is more important than reing them out of existence. So, yeah. But I, I really do like memes. I like that they can be used as a force for good as well as a force for pure evil. The, they they are completely impartial, and that's what I enjoy about them. I mean. And they're so different nowadays. Back then, it was so simple. All you needed to do had like a simple picture with a title and a subtitle and that's it but nowadays it's more complex with videos and gifs and just beyond that it's like what's the what's next for memes i don't i don't think any oh sorry uh i don't think any of that's necessary though i think the the big thing about dank memes is that if you want them to be dank you have to not try so hard um dankness a lot like moisture and moss which is what dank would refer to uh comes about unintentionally it's just the environment it germinates in um but if you try to force it to grow then it's not going to happen um uh, it's it's so you know the ultimate dank memes so like pepe and wojak are the ultimate dank memes because they came about unintentionally this unspoken agreed upon level of dankness where it was just being shared and there's so many things you can do with it it has it's it's funny in context but it's funny out of context as well and it's so versatile it can be used in literally any situation from very good to very evil and that's why they're great that's why i love them and they are so dank but when you try to force a meme to be dank then it's not it's not gonna work Memeology, the study of memes. This is what I'm saying. I did this three-part meme study. Because uh, I was really curious. I admit I'm a bit of a latecomer to dank memes. Um, I was like a slight... I, I kind of sort of slightly understood memes back when like MLG memes were popular. But I was... I pretended I didn't like memes for a long time. Because I just figured that nobody wanted me to like memes. <laughs> It's kind of hard to explain. It was I, like, I, 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 um, it's sort of like memes were are are like truly dank memes are like the counterculture kind of thing, and I didn't want this image of myself to be cultivated in that I'm some sort of <laughs> closet subversive or something, because that didn't fly with how I presented myself as a person on the internet. But after a certain point, I just got sick of pretending that I wasn't some sort of closet subversive. So. I just stopped pretending. I stopped giving a shit about what other people think. In certain ways, I uh, stopped giving a shit about okay. what other people think. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, what is... Do you watch anime? Yes. Any, uh, any animes you would recommend to fellow meme uh, anime watchers out there? Uh, yeah. My favorite anime series are Mononoke the series and not the movie um Natsume Yujin Cho Mushishi um Sayonara Zatsubo Sensei I would say Shingeki no Kyojin but not anymore um fuck me uh I don't have my anime list with me so I don't know I'm in the dark over here 
But yeah, definitely. Oh, Shiki as well. Um, yes, Mononoke and Shiki are the two I would recommend the most. Those two are my favorites of all time. Um, Natsume Yujin Cho is really close to being favorite of all time. It's just a bit too silly, a bit too tonally inconsistent sometimes, but it's great. I prefer anime that is, like, I don't like slice of life anime, I don't like sports anime or any of that stuff. Basically, any anime with an interesting story or a good set of characters is great with me. If it's supernatural, then that's just a bonus. Uh, um, what I've noticed on YouTube, there is an anime community on YouTube, mm -hmm. and they talk about mm -hmm. anime and have videos about anime. Um... Would you, uh, I don't, I doubt it, but would you ever consider thinking about, like, talking about anime in future videos, if you had no. the passion? Uh, no, I already did that. That's what I was doing. So, unlike most other cartoon reviewers or whatever, who would choose a specific thing, so cartoons or anime, um, I did all of it. So, cartoons and anime, 2D, 3D, stop motion... The anime. Uh, I did everything because I see all animation is equal. None of it is particularly better or worse than others. So I would give everything attention if I could. So that's... Uh, so I, I, I grouped the cartoon and the anime communities together, to be honest. I know they have different... They're different... They are different, but they... A lot of them have... <laughs> the cartoon and the anime communities have a lot of the same problems, so I just sort of grouped them together. Uh, Even though, yeah, the... The obsessives of both communities are definitely different, for sure. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, see, what do you think of people who say anime is just for kids? People don't say that. They say cartoons are for kids. They say that, people say that anime is for adults, because it's got deep, intricate plots that a baka gaijin like you wouldn't understand. People say cartoons are for kids, not anime. Uh, but they say, but, wait, 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 did, did I say that? Did I say anime in particular? I thought I said, okay, wait, I, you I said, was, an, you said anime. I meant to say, I meant to say was, what do you think of people saying animation is for kids? Uh, okay. Um, I tell them they're full of shit and that. Animation is just a medium of expression. That's like saying books are for kids. Or watercolor painting is for kids. It's just a method of expressing yourself. Yeah, Western cartoons are predominantly for children. That doesn't mean it's a children's medium. I made a whole video about this. <laughs> One of my favorite videos, actually. My favorite not review video is okay. that video. It's okay. the one that's my channel trailer right now. Um... But yeah, it's just a medium of expression. And saying that someone is childish for enjoying animation is massively hypocritical because animation is produced by adults. It's made by adults. So of course it's for everybody. If it was for children, it would be made by children. That's like, okay, well, maybe not. That's like saying toys are for children, therefore they need to be made by children. I guess it depends on where they're made. <laughs> Depending on that place's child right, labor laws. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, no, it just reminds me of um, kids producing toys. It just reminds me of, like, Big, where Tom Hanks is at, works at the toy store, and he's like a kid in a male's body. He's like, here, here's my ideas for toys. I'm going to make toys. That's fun. Woohoo! Yeah. Yeah, but that's the thing, is all of this stuff that's for children is made by adults. So obviously there has to be some level of appeal I mean, yeah, there's, like, preschool shows, but, hey, I have seen the crews of preschool shows get together and watch the episodes that they made of a preschool show, and they're 20 to 30 years older than the tar target demographic, and you know what they do? They laugh! They watch and they laugh and they have a good time. Doesn't mean that they're dumb or childish for laughing and having a good time watching these preschool shows, it just means that they have a good sense of humor about it. And they, it doesn't... Uh... It yeah. just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that much. Yeah, and then they uh, they tend to sneak in adult jokes and cartoons because yeah, not adults not are watching... preschool shows. Huh? Oh no, obviously not. I wasn't referring to that. I mean, dear God, um, God forbid. <laughs> well, there was the time where Rick and Morty had a cameo on My Little Pony. Yeah, that I saw that. Yeah, and that was not approved by Hasbro before it happened. 
<laughs> Whoopsie. I actually uh, did um, pre premix checking for that episode. So like uh, uh, QC QC for that episode, and it was like, oh shit, <laughs> Rick and Morty's in this episode. What do you say for the bone anatomy? Okay. <laughs> Uh, Rick and Morty. That's a great show. It uh, it has been tainted in my eyes. Still a great show, but tainted. It, it, tainted. If you want to talk about if you want to talk about shit memes, let's talk about Rick and Morty memes. Oh boy, just absolutely poisonous memes. <laughs> Dear God, I mean, I guess I understand. Like the whole Szechuan sauce ordeal was such a. A fucking mess. I knew. I knew that. But it's just like, I mean, I, it's a great show, but I don't. I don't know like the ins and out of what the fuck's going on outside of it. So, those memes, I tell you. <laughs> wow, I'm really like in the woods because I don't know a lot about the communities, you know, because I'm just a outsider looking in through a window. Like, hey, what's going on out there? Can it? Can I be let in? No. Okay, I'll be out here alone. I'm in a weird position because I'm an outsider and an insider. I communicate in an outsider's tongue, and yet I have the viewpoints of an insider. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, so how is the, uh, the work experience so far at the animation? It's, gr it's great. I really, really like it. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are trying to tell me, oh, give it a couple years and you'll be... You'll, you'll be as miserable as the rest of us. And it's like, you know, can you just stop it? Like, can you just let me be happy? I'm very happy where I am right now. So stop trying to make me miserable. Um, it I really enjoy the experience. I'm learning something new every day. And it's fascinating to see this stuff. I got to see some of the behind the show, behind the scenes of a show I really enjoy today. And I was like... I'm trying to sit there and, and listen quietly because I'm just like, okay, I need to learn this stuff. But I'm trying internally. I'm like, oh my god, look at that! That guy is being stretched. His model is being stretched off camera really far, and that's hilarious. It's, it's, it feels like it's where I belong, and that's the best feeling in the world. I think one of the best. Just, just a little fangirling inside, just like, oh my god, this is what I'm I waiting say for. I hate the term fangirling. I hate the term fan. No, it's admiration, I believe. That might sound like splitting hairs a bit, but it is. This is something I've wanted to do for so long, for two decades, pretty much. And I, I, I achieved it without racking up hundreds of thousands of dollars of student debt or wasting my time or complaining. I got here where I am now because I worked my fucking ass off and people gave me a chance. And I can't express how grateful I am for that. You know, not everybody gets a chance to be where I am and I'm not gonna be smug about it. I'm gonna show how much I appreciate it by doing the best I can to stay there and achieve the things I wanted to do. Not give up, basically, that's what I'm saying. So when I see things and it makes me happy to have seen them, I don't like when people try to take that away from me. This is a good time to ask about any advice you want to give out to any inspiring people out there who want to be in the industry somehow, whether it's through hard work, through education, or what have you. The advice I can give is don't give up. Just don't. Because if you give up, then and you'll never achieve anything. And I don't mean it in like a Shia LaBeouf, do it kind of way. I mean, there's so many ways you can get to where you want to be. In life and if you feel like you're being held back don't just give in to what you're being held back by try and overcome it uh, I've spoken to so many people who are like oh if only I could write if only I didn't have depression if only this if only that and it's like so you're just gonna sit here and not try to Im improve it you're not gonna try and get past this you're just gonna lament that you can't get past it are you trying though so it's not so much don't give up it's more try just try. And if you're not, you can't start on the top level. I know you want to be a director. I know you want to be a writer. I know you want to throw your ideas at the door and be like, and blow them all away. But that's not how it works. You got to play the game. You got to work your way up. Ingratiation is more important than your ideas. I guess in simpler terms, uh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. So network the shit out of people and 
work your way up through the proper channels. Don't kick the door down, because all you're going to do is get kicked out. What is the future for your channel, you, and your career? For my channel, I guess we'll just have to see how it goes. If people really don't like my new content, I might just cut it off altogether and just move to Twitch. That's kind of my fallout, my, my backup plan, is if... Because people seem to like me on Twitch. I don't know about YouTube, though. So, if things are really unsuccessful on YouTube and I get, like, massive amounts of hatred, I might just pack it in and move to Twitch. Like I said, I'm not doing this for a career anymore, so it's no, right. no big loss to me. Um, if things are successful on YouTube, then it's pretty much just stay the course. Just keep making the content people like. And uh, try not to die. This is that. With my career, though, um, continue looking for opportunities to pitch concepts to either my employers or outside investors. Uh, continue networking. Continue trying to speak to the right people. Continue trying to get into a more creative position as well so my ideas can be more accepted by my peers and coworkers uh, as well as people uh, in higher stations. And eventually, the end goal is to have my own cartoon be made um, so that... I can make my own animation studio and then just make other people's cartoons, including my own. That is the end goal. I will die a happy person if I have my own animation studio and I can make people's dreams come true. Because that was the goal. That was the dream, to make people happy. I don't care if I'm unhappy. I just want to make people happy. And making people happy is making their ideas come true. So that's the goal. But it's very expensive to run an animation company, so right. we're working the proper channels here. Yeah. Um, any, uh, who are your influences in animation? Trey Parker and Matt Stone are my primary influences, um, mostly with their attitude. It's that they can make a show that every that everybody is against. Not the viewers, but like, you know, oh, moral pundits and all this stuff, where they're like, these people are evil because they make this show. But throughout it all, through everything that Trey Parker and Matt Stone have been through, they're still creative partners. They haven't gotten into any major drama. Um, no scandals. They care about what they make. And that's it. And that's a huge inspiration for me. And also their ability to not give a fuck about offending people, too. And also their ability to have biting satire. Eh, not as biting as it used to be, but, you know, <laughs> when it right. was still when it was still biting. Uh, when, the world still, when the world needed South Park, they made it. They were there. And that was huge for me. Because I was always told... I always got the feeling, too, when I, when I was growing up, as they said... Don't don't ever meet your heroes. Don't ever idolize people because they'll let you down in the end. And it's like, well, why? Why do they have to let you down? Why don't you look for the good things in people? Why don't you look for the good side of people and not fantasize and over uh, idolize them? Idolize the good parts of them. Don't be blinded when they do bad things. And with Trey Parker and Matt Stone, it seemed like everything they did was right all the time. Even when they went to the Oscars high on LSD dressed in, in fancy dresses, it just felt like everything was right and it was deliberate. And that's the kind of, that's the kind of creator I want to be, is I'm not afraid to offend people or step on people's toes, but the ultimate goal is to entertain people and to make people happy to forget about their shit lives for a little bit and just share something with them that they can't get anywhere else so would you create just any kind of cartoon whether it's adult aimed for children just what what was the kind of the a goal for your future animation studio to produce cartoons so I have multiple ideas that span different demographics. I would say the only demographic I don't have covered is early life, so preschool shows. That's not I'm right. more of a, more of a storyteller and preschool shows don't tell stories. Right. So um but yeah, I have ideas for every demographic. So I've got uh 8 to 12 males. I've got a young adult series as well, males and females. 
I've got adult comedy series. I've got an adult drama series, which is like poison. There is not a single <laughs> adult drama television series that's animated. There are dramedies like BoJack Horseman, but not a straight drama. That's why I've put that one on the shelf for a while. <laughs> Because it, it, it would never be purchased. I would yeah. have to make it myself. But yeah, so I've got... I do prefer adult content in theory. In that it can express ideas that are more interesting than a children's show. But I don't want to produce adult content if the obligation is to always be inappropriate all the time. So always resort to the sex joke, the drug joke, the drinking heavily joke, the molestation joke. You know, that kind of stuff. Why not be adult in your content and not your attitude? I, I, I sort of cover this in that adult animation right. video I did right. that I like. Um, so yeah, being having an adult series is good because you can express ideas and themes you can't express in a, a show for children or teens. But I don't like the, oblig the idea that the obligation is to be inappropriate all the time. Uh, what genre do you like? <clears throat> like fantasy... Um... They've got action, uh, drama, what have you. Well, definitely drama. And not, like, David Cage levels. Not melodrama. Just drama. So, characters having conflicts, that kind of stuff. Um, and not, not like... Ugh! I actually plan to do a video on this at some point. The suffering versus torture dynamic. Uh, but that, that'll be later. Um... So, yeah, definitely drama, character interactions and all that. But in terms of actual genres, I have uh, two sci-fi series. One contemporary series, which is a subversive take on romance. Um, I have two fantasy series and a horror concept as well. What else do I have? I don't even know anymore. Um, yeah, so primarily fantasy and science fiction, but not like Star Trek, Star Wars type science fiction, just more thematic science fiction, technology, that kind of stuff. Um, those are the ones I'm investing most time in at the moment are the science, the contemporary science fiction concept, um, because that one is the most likely to get purchased. It is the most flexible concept as well. Mm. Uh... What do you think about the current franchises that are taking over, like, the box office and television, such as Star Trek, Star Wars, and, of course, all the Marvel shows and movies? And you don't care. Not much. I mean, they keep people employed. It's fine with me. Um, a lot of those people are British Columbian ex extras, because quite a few of the Marvel shows are filmed in uh, the Fraser Valley slash Lower Mainland. So they keep people employed. Uh, which is good. I have no objection to them. It's fine. I just, I do hope that uh, the entertainment industry, the people in charge, continue to invest in original ideas as well as pre-existing uh, franchises. Because, yeah, original ideas are going to be important for the future of entertainment. Right. Especially because nowadays there's way more options for getting ideas out there. So internet, there's streaming, television, movies personal distribution there's so many ways to get your ideas out there that i hope that green lighters don't sla don't slam doors in people's faces when they don't need to uh you live in vancouver i do not live in vancouver but i work there uh uh so you're in canada but not in vancouver because i was just going to ask about uh the legality of going to Vancouver just for potential jobs or whatever, because I heard Vancouver is a, a thriving city, becoming North Hollywood in a sense for production. and It is, because there are some juicy British Columbia tax credits you can get for producing media in the province. So that's why most of them sort of conglomerate in the lower mainland, mostly Vancouver, some in Burnaby. Um, mostly Vancouver and Burnaby. <laughs> um well, I mean, it's legal as long as you get a work permit, but you have to work. You can't come up here on a work permit and not work. Um, but you know, as long as you have, as long as you go through the proper channels, yeah, there's nothing illegal about coming to Canada to work. Um, yeah, there's over a hundred studios in Vancouver alone, and they're all in the same area. 
Oh, oh my. That's, I gotta say, that's one reason why you don't talk shit about other people in the entertainment industry, especially in Canada, because everybody knows, knows each other, and everybody goes between, vi- like, studios when they're done, and uh, you don't want that to spread, ever. So you just, you keep it to yourself. If you, ha- if you actually have something bad to say about somebody, which I don't, but if you did, you don't spread that shit. <laughs> Don't go online and be like, oh my god, this guy from the studio is such an asshole. It'll spread and you will not get jobs. Yeah, that's true. Um, what is the difference between Canada and the U.S.? There's a lot different between Canada and the U.S. <laughs> like, uh, would you your, your state? Would you stay in Canada to work, or do you you're selling stuff to the U.S. or you selling to Canada when it comes to like cartoons and? Well, if the opportunity came that some American production company was interested in my idea, I would absolutely jump at that. I'd get a work permit, like a work visa, and I'd cross borders. I have to admit I'm a little bit scared of America, but that's just because I've never spent an extensive amount of time there. And also, the media tries to make you afraid of places you don't go and, like, you don't live. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, But I've been to America briefly. I think the furthest I've gone is Seattle. (laughs) <laughs> which oh, is like yeah. that's barely, okay that's barely yeah. a, a dip into american soil yeah uh, exactly oh um, yeah. so yeah i don't have a good perspective on america because i've never okay. spent a lot of time there uh... as far as i know the only thing different are the stereotypes so yeah canada has um we have government health care we have like socialized health care but there's massive contra or not contradictions there's massive miscommunication on that so for, from my American audience, they're like, so if you, like, break your leg, you can get that fixed for free, right? It's like, well, <laughs> technically, yeah. If you went to the emergency with your leg broken, they would fix it and you wouldn't be charged for it because you pay you pay for universal health care, basically. But if you wanted to get a boob job or something, you have to pay for that. It's elective surgery. So... No hospital will turn you away at the door because you don't have money. But if you opt in for surgeries or something like that, you have to pay. Like, I need to get a wisdom tooth removed because it's chipped. I have to pay for that. But I have dental coverage at work. So if I didn't have that, I'd still have to pay. Um, So it's emergency care and basic health coverage that's covered by the socialized health care program, so the medical services plan. But you can't just roll up and be like, I would like a third leg grafted onto my back, please, for free. (laughs) That's not... It's not how it works. Also, you you can't just go into a pharmacy and just scoop up bags full of pills and just down them and be like, yeah, this is free. You pay for medication. You it needs to be covered by your your healthcare plan. It's it's not free. Most of what you have is not free. It's just not as expensive as America. Okay. So there's that... like ma- huge uh ma- like miscommunications on that and, and misgivings for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of people don't talk about Canada that much, and nobody talks about what goes on in there. I mean, I am oh, just south of um, ah shit. What was it? Not Toronto. Toronto's west of me. Okay, so I've been to Toronto, yeah. But yeah, I've I've been in living in the same place for God knows how long, and. I just want to get out of the state I'm living in and just explore, the, like, wherever and just find my place in the world. But um... I might be biased. I might be. Because I haven't really been to everywhere in Canada. I've been to Alberta. I've been to Ontario. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> but I think British Columbia is the most beautiful part of Canada. Every part of it is gorgeous. Especially if you go up to see the sky, there's it's just oh it's so beautiful. But you know, my brother says that Montreal is the most beautiful part of Canada, but I can't argue with him. I've never been there, so it's also ball bustingly cold over there. Whereas BC is not ball bustingly cold. The coldest it just gets is like maybe minus six degrees. That would be Celsius. Uh... Um, so it's it's cold, but it isn't like freeze to death cold. Whereas Montreal gets like minus forty degrees. Celsius. Yeah, yeah. I, I experienced that cold weather. It's just I'm so used to cold. I mean, grew up in 
good old state of Wisconsin, Atlanta cheese, so yay for all that. But See, I don't know shit about Wisconsin. I would have figured it was warm there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about this, this stuff. Is- I'm just... very ignorant about uh, America other than the stereotypes. It's because America, in Canadian media, from what I've experienced, America oh, is very sensationalized. America is a lot like the crazy older brother that Canada has, where sometimes they get into crazy shenanigans and you're just kind of vaguely aware of what's going on. You don't really communicate that much. You just know about the crazy shit that he gets up to. But you don't really engage because there's nothing you can do to change him anyway. That's what America in Canadian media is like. Just this crazy <laughs> bastard who just does whatever he wants all the time, and you're just like, okay. You don't really enable it, but you can't change it. Land of the free! <laughs> yeah. We do whatever we want, yay! <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, you, 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 you're just waiting for the day that you hear that he blew his head off with a shotgun or, like, stuck a firecracker up his ass and gave himself a lethal abscess. You're just waiting for it. You just don't know when it'll come. Oh, that's yeah. what living next to America is like. And then living next to Canada, you're just like, no, they're like the nicest people in the world, and they say a, a boot, which we don't, which we don't. So <laughs> a and a boot are Newfie uh, expressions. So if you have a Newfoundland accent, you'd be like, oh yeah, I'm going to the store. I'm gonna get me some medicine. Uh, most Canadians don't speak like that. Most Canadians don't have a new fee accent. I also don't have a new fee accent. Uh, but because it's it's funny, it's a funny accent. They j- most people just assume that all Canadians speak like that. It's just, yeah, it's just, you know, no matter where you live, there's going to be, like, some glaring details that we don't know about each other. Exactly, uh, and it's just too tiring to get to know each other on a more personal level. True. It's just the way you... Uh, I mean, God, I, I just I just want to like pull out like a U.S. map. It's like, hey, which state is this? Which state is this? Which state is that? I might know. <laughs> it really depends. <laughs> because, I mean, I, I wouldn't even like if you pull up a map of Canada, I wouldn't even like know like all the provinces or the cities. Like maybe the main ones, like Montreal, Toronto, and Vancouver, but that's it. Do you mean provinces? Yes, thank you. <laughs> I told you I mispronounced shit. But also, Canada has territories. Ah! I don't know geography, so I was just like... Well, neither do I. All I know is can- Canadian geography. It, you, you know, in school, basically what they taught us in school about America, they were like, this is Canada. This is where all the Canada stuff is, and we're going to learn about Canada. Here's America. So anyway, Canada. <laughs> we're going to talk about Canada. <laughs> it was just like, yeah, America's there. And that's about it. I remember learning in, like, grade 8. No, I didn't go to grade 8. In, like, grade 9. I think it was grade 9. Social studies. The the most they taught us about America in terms of geography was, oh, yeah, Alaska, that's not part of Canada. And Hawaii is down there and it's warm. Because people in class asked. They were like, so why is Alaska not Canada? And they're like, Russians, I think. (laughs) That was, like, the extent of the lesson, was just, like, so Alaska isn't Canadian because Russia or something. All right, anyway, back to Canada. It's like, okay. Oh, yeah, it's just, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's all, it's the same here in the U.S. You learn about, God, I'm I'm even going through, like, uh, history right now, just, like, talking about the Revolutionary War and how we just how america was founded it was like oh my god all these details and yet no mention of canada i mean maybe a few about like how the french went to canada or like those french canadians became a thing but that's just about it um don't call them french canadians they prefer quebecois if you call a quebecois a french canadian they'll punch your face off okay because quebecois are not french even though they speak french uh, it's it's complicated. Quebec is like yeah, Quebec is like the Tumblerista of Canada. They want to be referred to by their own name. They don't want to be part of the family anymore. They're all snooty and uptight. <laughs> they all eat weird, and they insist they insist that they're the most beautiful, and yet they're the most cold. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. Okay. Um, 
But yeah, yeah, Canadian history is super boring. That's why you don't learn about it in U.S. schools, I bet, because it's just the fur trade. That's all it was, was the fur <laughs> trade. Just like, so people went over here and they sold some furs, and then those other guys went over there and they sold some furs, and then there was like fur over here and fur over there, fur everywhere. And then Canada. <laughs> it was like, this is boring. <laughs> we didn't have crazy wars and, and presidents and we didn't have that stuff it was just like so, so the people started here and they sold some furs and then they went over there to sell some more furs and then there was the hudson bay company who sold furs <laughs> and then pemmican and then canada <laughs> damn yeah so it was immensely boring so if you're trying to like sell the idea of canada to people who are interested in visiting or even like moving to canada what would you what was the selling point of canada uh, you won't get gunned down in the street or in a mall or in a theater or in a church or in just anywhere. You won't get gunned down. I'd say that's a pretty big selling point. <laughs> crime rates, okay. Low crime I'm rates. Aware, I'm aware that I'm slightly naive on this subject, and, and guns are a lot more widespread in Canada than I was previously aware of, but I will say that I've lived in Canada my entire life, and the only people I've ever seen wield a gun are cops. And even then, I've never heard of a cop shooting anyone here. Oh, that's not true. But they, they don't really use force, like deadly force, as much with the cops. So yeah, when I, the first time I saw a gun on a cop, I was like, that's a gun! What kind of Canadian has a gun? But I've never seen anyone carry a gun. You can't carry a concealed weapon here. So... I think that would be huge culture shock if I went to, like, Texas or something and I'd see people carrying guns out in the open. I'd just be like, are you going to shoot me? Like, it's... I'm not saying this in a, you know... Right. I, I, what is the word? Jingoist? I'm not saying this in a jingoist sense, but it, it would just be, like, reflexive. I see a gun and I'm going to assume you're going to shoot me because I've never seen a gun on anybody but a policeman. So, if you, yeah, you're you're much less likely to be gunned down in the streets in Canada, so if you're afraid of that, you can come here. Oh, but gas is pretty expensive here right now, so don't drive. Oh, okay then. Yeah. Gas Just is walk. expensive. Ah, but, Jesus. I, I mean, like, it's expensive to the point where it's not even funny anymore. Like, we're at record-breaking highs for oh gas prices in, in bank. Yeah, in the GVRD, we are in record-breaking gas prices, baby. Oh, that sucks. <laughs> Holy shit. Yes, it does. Damn. No, actually, uh, another thing I think about, sort of a stereotype of Canada, we just... That everybody lives in igloos? No, that, no that's Alaska. <laughs> the... Oh, that we have milk in bags. That's one of them. Which, yeah, some uh, of us have milk in, milk in bags, but that's more of a uh, East Coast Canadian thing, which yeah, I was that's... aware of recently. But in the West Coast, we do not have milk in bags. <laughs> it's in cartons. The only place I had ever seen milk in bags was over the border in the United States. So stop saying we have milk in bags everywhere. I was gonna it's say, really annoying. That, there, there, there's a place nearby that I can actually buy a bit of milk in a bag, so it's not like a Canadian thing. It's, it's it's some places in America you can buy them in a bag. So, you know what we do have in bags though? Kinder surprises. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> we have um, cheese curds in bags because we make a lot of poutines. So you can go down to like the grocery store and buy a bag of oh, cheese curds. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, another thing about the state of Wisconsin is that we do produce cheese, and cheese curds is one of them. We there's select factories and places you can buy cheese curds in a bag. So, mm -hmm. and they're like nice when they come out fresh, and they're just like squeaky. It's so ah oh, so delicious. Oh, that's another thing about Canada too. Our poutines are better than yours. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, obviously. I made a poutine for dinner a couple nights ago. I sold the plate. <laughs> Typical Canadian. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, my poutine. <laughs> oh, that's a good poutine, Derry. Let me yeah. tell you about the poutine I made. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like, every restaurant you go to, even if it's a fast food restaurant, you can get a poutine. You can get them at Tim Hortons. You can get them at McDonald's. You can get them at any hole-in-the-wall restaurant because, A, they're super easy to make, and, B, it's like the national food. 
and they are goddamn delicious. You are missing out if you've never had a poutine before. Oh, you heard it here first, people. It's great. Check it out. They're really not hard. Slap some fries in the oven, cook up some gravy, get some shredded cheese if you don't have cheese curds, and put it on the fries, and you have a poutine. That is literally all you have to do. It is not complicated, and you will not regret it. They're tasty. Very tasty. Oh, man, I wish I lived in Canada. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just research, and maybe I'll move to Canada one day. You know what's a really nice place in Canada that unfortunately is being overtaken by Australian tourists? It's Whistler. Whistler's like an hour and a half drive away from Vancouver, and it's so gorgeous. There's like Shannon Falls near it. There's uh, just yeah waterfalls. It's underneath the uh, Blackcomb as well. It's a huge mountain, huge like winter mountain. Just gorgeous area. And then all along the Sea to Sky Highway is just ocean. Just the Pacific Ocean, and it's Jesus Christ! Uh, it's it's so gorgeous. Yeah, it is, Hannaby. It is gorgeous, just like you. You're gorgeous. <laughs> How many cats do you have? I have three cats. Ah, you're a cat person then, or do you mm -hmm. like dogs? I love them both. I love all animals. Ah, what's your favorite animal? My favorite animal is I I would say out of obligation it's cats because I own cats right. but actually, actually my favorite animals are owls i love bar barn owls especially they're like little ghosts <laughs> they're so cute um but yeah i really like birds like some barn owls seagulls crows um just simple birds but um yeah i love cats and i adore dogs uh my workplace allows dogs actually it's really cool so i get to pet other people's dogs oh uh, yeah, I know, it's really cool. It's adorable. Yeah, but in general, I just really love animals. And I know some people will be like, how can you love animals if you eat them? Just, uh, well, we're not going to get into that. Let's no. just say that I love all animals and I'm not willing to talk about that right now. I don't want to talk about it either, dear God. Yeah. Um, no, yeah, this, uh, honestly, this has been a great interview. It's great getting to know you. And I appreciate all the knowledge and uh, wise words you have. I wish you luck in your future. And, Thanks. Uh, and, uh, yeah, check her out. Where can people find you? So, I, you can find me on YouTube. You can just type in Eye of Saul. It's the first thing that comes up. I would say look for me more on Twitter, though, because I'm there more actively than YouTube. Because YouTube, I'm only planning to upload two to three videos a month. Whereas Twitch, two to three videos a week. So, if you, if you really can't get enough of me, then you can find me on Twitch. Uh, again, just Eye of Saul. Um, but yeah, YouTube and Twitch is mostly where you can find me. Um, I do chat with people, so don't, I'm not, uh, you know, snooty, aloof person. If you want to chat, feel free to chat with me. I'm all over the place, baby. You can always find me. Yep. Just search for it and just check her out. She's pretty cool. And, uh, this has been Mixtape Tonight and I'll see you guys on the next night of Mixtape Tonight. See ya.